that's weird not to see it. Hello, and I believe we're alive. Are we live? All right. Uh, I am here with Jim Richards. Hi, well. Correct. We've had plenty of uh, lead up to this big moment. Uh, we tried to go live a week ago. We had some technical difficulties. So, um, you know, the time space continu continuum is difficult with Australia being upside down uh, for the Wi Fi wavelengths. You're in Australia, right? No, I'm, I'm from New Zealand. Our um, company is from Australia. I'm, I am right. in Illinois right now. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Well, everything is right side up in Illinois. So, cheers. I think I was the technical problem. You, you're just being kind. Yeah. Anyway, um, we're here, wherever here is, and you um, are the CEO. Do I have anything correct here of Milkademia? That's right. Yes. So Milkademia, I actually hadn't really heard of it until a couple months ago. And my lady friend, you are her favorite uh, milk for, you know, her tea and her matcha lattes and all that stuff. So Milkademia first of all, what the heck is it and why, you know, what does it taste like? Is it good for us? All that kind of stuff. Okay. So milkadamia is a uh, macadamia um, based, macadamia nut based non-dairy milk. We, we, as a company, we are macadamia farmers. That's where we started. We're not a beverage company that decided to make um, macadamia. We, um, we grow macadamias and we used to press them for oil and just sell them as macadamias. Mm. Um, our, our farmer who grows them for us uh, in our farm, he's very much a um, a gentle farmer. He really cares about what's happening to the soil and he does all these natural um, alternate ways to grow macadamias. And he put so much effort into it, it used to distress him that uh, we would sell the macadamias and they would immediately be turned into candy. You know, people would slap chocolate around them or uh, sure. roast in salt. And, um, and he was growing this really healthy product and it kept getting turned into candy. So we looked for an alternative. Um, macadamia milk, milkadamia, is uh, one of the things that we discovered. It's sort of taken over most of the other things. We did some skincare as well. Uh, yeah. But milkadamia is is consuming us. You know, it's growing really, really fast. So now we're growing more than trees. It is, um, yeah, it's taken over our lives a little bit. Right, certainly how we uh, heard about you all. So um, I, right here in boulder colorado is where silk soy started and silk soy was the first alternative to dairy milk uh, i think back in the 90s and uh, it was kind of this genius wild idea to make milk out of anything other than um our poor cows and um it was made out of soy and and since then you know there's been some concerns about the monoculture farming of soy and the health of soy and there's this explosion there's almond milk i mean every cafe you go to there's coconut milk, there's uh, now milkadamia, macadamia nut milk. So who was it or how, what's the genesis story? Who first thought, hey, we have these macadamia nuts, we could make milk out of them just like any other nut milk. So um, that was my um, thought. And nice. I was running out, we call it a processing plant, but really it is a um, factory that cracks macadamias and then Ooh. we braid them. So all we do is take the shell off macadamias and we had all these um, broken ones that I was looking for a way to use. And um, because we we use raw macadamias for milkadamia, we grind it down to a really fine powder, um, mm. fine paste actually, not a powder. And um, it doesn't really have to be a whole macadamia when it starts if you're going to grind it down to a paste. So we started using our pieces. And um, wow. I have previously been part of a company that launched a soy milk in New Zealand many mm. years ago, obviously after after right. the Porto, Colorado thing. Right, and, right. You know, it wasn't that far from um, from what we did to um, extend to a macadamia milk. The macadamias are delicious, but they're also fairly expensive, you know. So yeah. um, figuring out how to produce a milk that wasn't um, unbelievably expensive and therefore exclusive was something we had to do. So was that was the solution just using the the broken up macadamias, sort of the scraps? Um, it was sort of that, but also we we own the farms and we own the processing all the way through. So because it's all ours, we can um, we can shift our costs and you know profitability around a little bit. Uh -huh. and so it, we made it work. We we've made it work. Yeah, that's and it impressive. Is, yeah. 
Um, cause macadamia is definitely are an expensive nut. They're the expensive nut in a way. Um, yeah. so, and health wise, tell me about, so is there a, is there a significant difference between macadamia nut milk versus dairy milk? Uh, let's start there between those two. So look, I think the, there is, but I think the biggest difference, you know, people often ask us what's, um, what are the positives about, um, macadamia milk and yeah. there are plenty, but I think. It's what's not in there that's most important. You know, there's no blood or pus or cow droppings. Um, there's no drugs, all the drugs. Yes, yes. We're, we're not um, minimizing the effect of uh, medicines. We're, you know, we're, we're not adding a whole range of chemicals in there. But And we're not being, there's no animals inconvenienced. Um, it's, there's, there's a lot of cruelty and a lot of, um, a lot of issues are avoided. And then of course, we're not polluting, we do the opposite. So, you know, when you've got a dairy, you have all this waste that you've got to get rid of. Mm -hmm. They mostly put it into lagoons. And, um, you know, the US is littered with these um, lagoons full of basically raw sewage that are, um, you know, it just takes a flood or a broken dam or something. And then we have polluted up another river or another stream. And in fact, most of it finds its way there either quickly or slowly into our water anyway. And um, trees do the opposite. You know, instead of um, polluting, they actually filter our air, they filter our water, they do exactly the opposite. Yeah. So all that part of it is is great. Feels uh, pretty good. Yeah, I mean, you know, most people know this who graduated from high school, but we also forget this, that yeah. every single large mature tree is sucking up carbon and putting out clean air for all of us to breathe. It does. They, they, um, Magic. They breathe out the sky. So yeah, you know, well we love that concept with all our trees. Um, the other thing about trees is that they stay in the ground a long time. You know, the oldest macadamia tree they've found is 300 years old, which is not particularly old for a tree, but uh -huh. apparently old for a macadamia tree. Yeah. And, um, you know, that period of time allows the microbes in the soil, you know, if you leave the soil undisturbed, um, for that period of time, amazing things happen. There's all sorts of networks and interconnections that mm. that create new soil. Um, the whole basis of regenerative farming, you know, is don't plow. The I learned recently that, you know, we hear about soil sequestering CO2 all the time. And um, I never really understood exactly what it does with it. But the plants take, it's the plants that take the CO2 down into the soil. And the CO2 stays in the pores in the soil. So all the little gaps in the soil, they're all filled up with CO2. The minute you run a plow through that, you release it all straight back into the atmosphere. Right. Plus, plus disrupt everything that was um, working to turn it into, um, into soil. So that's something really magical. So we go to Natural Products Expo, I'm sure you do too. And do. Uh, you know, we were interviewing a ton of regenerative organic uh, farmers and advocates, and uh, it's really magical to think that we could reverse climate change to the extent to which we support regenerative agriculture, as it's called, regenerative, not just organic, it's a higher standard. Um, you're actually just repeating in a layman's way what you said, we're just stuffing CO2 or carbon back into the earth where it's rich, where it's used, and um, everyone wins and we get nice macadamia nuts out of it. We get that as well, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so nice macadamia nuts, we all know they're delicious and yeah. Yeah, they certainly are. Yeah. Um, but they're also a, a health food, you know, it's not recognized because they're so nice and most people see them as an indulgent treat. Yeah. Uh, the concern being that they're high in oil out of all the um, nuts, they're the highest in oil, but it's that oil that makes them so magic. Mm. Um, if I tell you quickly a story that was told to me, there's some researchers that were looking for um, the trigger that will make two people with similar um, physiques. One of them gain weight just by passing a donut store and the other can eat anything and never gains any weight. And those, they were looking for that trigger. What what makes that happen? They, unfortunately, they didn't find it. But um, uh, while they were looking for it, they, um, they found there's a commonality for everyone who's obese or everyone on the way to being obese. And that commonality is inflammation in the, in the intestinal tract, somewhere in the intestinal tract. And they theorized that um, an inflamed intestinal tract allows a lot of nutrient, more nutrient than it normally would into the blood. Once it's in the blood, the blood's got nothing to do but store it, 
as mm. fat somewhere. Hmm. And so they decided they would they would see if that theory worked and they would find a way to reduce um, the inflammation. And they looked for lots and lots of different things that they could do this naturally. It turned out that macadamia oil was like 100 times better than the next best thing they found. Wow. And so they, um, we were still, I was still in Australia at that point running our macadamia oil plant and I got a phone call from these researchers in Europe who asked me um, how much macadamia oil is in the world, you know, and I, I said, look, it's a, a niche product off a niche product, you know, there's not a lot of macadamia oil. And they said, well, that's not good enough. You have to find plenty. And then they explained to me this situation that when they um, gave, they do this on rats and mice, you know, when they gave these obese rats and mice macadamia, just a selection of them, macadamia oil, um, it reduced the inflammation and by the same amount, it reduced their weight gain. They were still on a really high fat diet. Wow. So they didn't go so far as to start start them losing weight because um, that wasn't what the research had been funded for. But they, um, they found that if they could reduce 50% of the inflammation, they re reduced 50% of the weight gain. And then as apparently they do in these... Um, these experiments, they then, they kill them all at the end. You know, they take all these rats and mice that they've got this information off and then they um, they do autopsies on them all. And when they autopsy the these rats and mice, when you make them as obese as they were, they also get diabetes. So they were obese with diabetes. Yeah. They were really surprised to find that the rats and mice that had been given macadamia oil were... Um, their bones and their muscles had resensitized to insulin. And so it appeared that it did two staggeringly amazing things. One was that it helped um, with inflammation of the intestinal tract, which is part of the process of gaining too much weight. And the other thing it helped with um, diabetes. Hmm. So we went to those scientists and we asked them if they would um, do more research on macadamia also we could tell the story with you know greater clarity. Um, we offered to pay for it all, but they were on to the next thing and um, they wanted us to pay for the next thing, which was something to do with a drop of blood could tell your actual genetic age or something. I, it was something that we weren't interested in and they were, they had moved on. They were no longer interested in the... Yeah. Um, so that's as far as we've got at this point. But because we do skincare out of macadamia oil as well, we know it's highly anti-inflammatory externally and apparently internally. Uh -huh. And um, that's one of the benefits of macadamias over other nuts. All nuts are quite similar, but each one has its own little superpower. Yeah. And, you know, the superpower of macadamia is it's it's so anti-inflammatory and so gut friendly, you know. And it's probably got a good amount of protein. No, macadamias are low in protein. Um, out of all the nuts, they're probably the lowest, but, um, you know, we get enough protein, seriously. Yeah. I know people are always wanting extra protein, but, yeah. Especially in the vegan world, I think we're obsessed with it. We have uh, blogs on elephant. The stat is that the average American gets something like five times the daily recommended amount of protein, and it's yeah. actually not healthy. And literally, I'm vegan. I'm 200 pounds and super active. And uh, people, first question they always say is, "How are you getting your protein?" Of course, yeah. Implying that I'm like wilting on my way to, uh, you know, yeah. you know, 10 feet away from uh, my bed. Literally. So um a couple questions so you say regenerative so does that mean i know you're not technically organic you're not certified no, so we're not. does that mean you are using kind of conventional pesticides or no okay so regenerative farming um yeah. anyone who switches to regenerative they sort of immediately use 90 percent less um inputs than they used to so that's fertilizer chemical everything um and eventually they don't do any because when you're a regenerative farmer, what you're really doing is you're farming soil. You know, what you're doing is looking after the soil. And, and the expectation then is everything starts there. Great soil, you'll get great um, crops and, and, and great productivity, great nutrient density, all out of good, good soil. Soil, um, those little microbes, they're the silent engine of life on this whole planet between, between them and photosynthesis. That's what yeah. keeps us all going, those two things. And so you end, what you're doing is... You're not really growing macadamia nuts. You are, you're growing microbes whose names you don't even know. The interactions between each other that create new soil you don't know. So the only measure you have that you're doing well is at the end of the year if you have created new topsoil. 
um, regenerative farming is all about creating brand new topsoil. So does, you, you have cover, what do you call it, cover crops? Yes, definitely. We don't, we don't plow. We, yeah. um, on a plantation like uh, a macadamia orchard, you don't plow anyway. So, you know, that part of it hasn't changed. We use um, macadamias attract a lot of rodents because they're such a rich source of oil and food, you know. Right. Um, most, most farms who are trying to get rid of um, rodents, they put poison everywhere. They basically ring their farm with, with baits and poisons and things, which don't just kill rodents. They kill the things that eat rodents and the things that eat them, and it just goes on and on, you know. And, and it's not all eaten, so some of it gets in the soil. So And it kills the birds and, yeah. Yeah, and, and those little things we don't know their names of in the soil. You know, there's in healthy soil, one teaspoon of healthy soil, there's billions of um, microorganisms in a teaspoon. And there's apparently miles and miles of these really fine filaments that, that are connectors between trees and, and between lots of things that happen down there. Um, if you're leaving poison around, you're going to kill those. It's going to seep into the soil and you're, you know, you're doing the opposite of what you're trying to do. Yeah. So on our farm, we have, we've made nesting sites for um, owls. Um, one pair of nesting owls, they'll eat three and a half thousand rodents in one nesting season. So we have we have them all around our farm and that's the way that we take care of that. Um, there's always other ways. You know, the, the amazing thing is, you know, in, in the US here, when, when European settlers arrived, they found this rich country so full of abundance. The soils were incredibly deep and incredibly rich. Um, and yet no man had had anything to do with that. You know, we start thinking we know better. Um, Regenerative is really taking us back to those times, you know, back so we do less and less ourselves and we allow the, the natural processes to do more and more. It's incredibly um, humbling because, yeah. you know, I get into arguments with people who claim to be on the side of science, and I certainly am on the side of science and respect science, but there's this notion somehow that humans are separate from nature and we're better than it. And if you work with an ecosystem, I don't know if you saw the movie, uh, biggest little farm that's been out in theaters. It's all about these farmers learning to work with the ecosystem and, you know, how to eat the rodents, how they, you know, making homes for the owls to eat the rodents and everything kind of cycles. Yep. Uh, nature actually works pretty well if you let oh, it. Yeah, it, it did for uh, eons, you know, before yep. we suddenly decided, and it's relatively recently that um, we've, we've really started to um, impact the health of our planet. And yeah, we, Regenerative is taking us back. You know, there, there is a natural order to be recovered, to be one again, and regenerative is helping that. But one of the great things about it is farmers who take on regenerative, um, they start using strange words, words they haven't used for a long time, things like um, satisfaction and joy and the love of the land. Um, you know, there's two types of farming. There's farming where they exploit the land that they've been given, and all they're doing is trying to wring as much profit out of it as they can. And there's farming where they enhance um, the land, feel like stewards, making it better and better. And they're leaving something for the next generation. That that changes your heart. That changes the way um, you react to everything around you. And so we see regenerative farmers become, um, they become almost evangelists for um, the difference that they can make. And and that's a good thing. You know, it's. It's amazing to hear these crusty old guys talking about joy and excitement and how they love waking up in the morning and walking out onto the land where they used to hate the idea that it was another day in a tractor circling and circling, spraying stuff, you know? Yeah, I mean, when you see photos of uh, farmers having to wear basically like hazmat suits so they can spray the crops, yeah. you know, the crops being food that we eat. You know, poison and food, as Jane Goodall said, who thought to combine those two? She has some quote like... Yeah, yeah. You know, who thought to put poison on our food? That doesn't add up. Um, but there are ways working with the ecosystem to kill those pests and other things, pests, you know, everything has a role in the ecosystem and everything eats everything basically. And we get to eat your milkadamia or drink it in our you garden. Do. You do. So this is, I'll show you some milkadamia just for anyone who hasn't. Um, yeah. Thank you. This is our original. We have um, unsweetened and unsweetened vanilla. Where am I? I'm disappearing here. Yeah, you're good. You're there. We're there? Yeah. Okay. That's what to look for. Yeah. Uh, but but also look for any um, plant-based product. Any plant-based product that is um, that is growing well, 
that's a good step forward. So I guess my question about why you're not certified organic, but you're doing regenerative is how do we, you know, as consumers, we've basically been trained, hopefully not to trust food corporations because they're yeah. always going to trick us. So we want some sort of certification. And in the U S at least we generally trust the organic certification. So how do we know that, you know, there aren't pesticides that you're doing stuff, right? You're talking about the owls killing the rodents and, you know, you're doing all this amazing stuff. You're soil farmers. Um, how do we know unless we come visit, which sounds good. Yeah, please do. Yeah. Um, th there's an issue there. It's a bigger than um, it sounds. Look, we started taking our farm towards organic. So we, we started the, the um, cycle. Our farmer himself rebelled against it. And it was his idea. He wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, in the end, he said, look, I'm, I'm a farmer. I'm not a bookkeeper. I'm, I've just switched from being on the land to being in the office. Um, I, you know, I'm accounting, ticking boxes and accounting for things all the time. That um, Sure. Now, that's one farmer. That's just his view. Do you know what percentage of farms in the U.S. are organic? I would guess, uh, I think like 4% of our food is organic. So what percentage of farms? Maybe half a percent or something? Yeah, so it's less than 1%. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the best farmers of all time are going to be regenerative organic. You know, there's nothing, this is not anti-organic. Organic, organic are, are, do a great job, but, but it's a narrow focus. The focus is on um, yeah. not using any chemical inputs, which is a good thing. But in the process of doing that, there's a lot of farms that... Um, the way they handle weeds is they disc the soil all the time. So they're like mini plows, you know, sure. and they repeatedly year after year um, and not year after year, month after month. Now, yeah. each time they're tearing open the soil and, you know, we've said what that does. Um, but it also, it breaks apart the soil itself. The soil, there's a book called um, Kiss the Soil. In there, there's a soil expert in the U.S. And he says that the most degraded soils he found in the U.S. were on organic farms that were using the plow and the discs uh, for weed control. Now, when they stop doing that, that's going to be fine, you know. So we are supporters of organic farming, absolutely. Yeah. But if you've only got less than 1% uptake after all this time, um, there's some barrier. There's something causing um, that slowness of uptake. With regenerative farming um, and without there being... Um, some group of people who have decided that they are going to be the inspectors and who are going to set the rules and who are going to you know follow through who you have to pay by the way they don't do it for nothing sure. um, you they could be a barrier what we need is 20 percent of the currently cultivated soil on the planet to go to regenerative and we turn around the whole co2 issue at 20 percent that's a long way from less than one percent so any barriers that are in the way I'd be happy if 40% went halfway, which get the same result. Sure. Um, so why we are so keen on regenerative farming is that it, it you don't wait till you're 100% there. You're not looking for perfection. You are looking to start taking steps in the right direction. And sure. I've no doubt that eventually it will be certified for sure. Um, yeah. But yeah, I'm just say from the get started, get started, you know. What's that? In the meantime, we want to encourage every farmer to get started. Yeah. You know, take some yeah. steps. If, if you just do cover crops and stop plowing, those are good steps to take. Right. For sure. Yeah. yeah. If you reduce the poisons on the food, yeah. There's there's one other thing is that regenerative farming increases the amount of um, produce you produce in the same place. And that means you can still sell it for a low price and be more profitable than you were. Mm. Organic farming... In, in too many instances, requires the high price. Um, mm. You're producing less because you've gone organic, and you're therefore got to charge more for what you've got. That makes it that makes it a bit more exclusive than we want it to be. Um, regenerative farming can happen in the third world. It can happen anywhere, and anyone can afford it. So, sure. um, and I'm not an expert in that in this area. You know that whole societal what do we do with it. Is a yeah. little beyond me, but but what I do know is that we need farmers to be taking steps, and the easier we can make it for them, and the more interesting, exciting, and the less um, the less this we put barriers in the way, the better off we're all going to be. So, yeah, 
Yeah, I, I would uh, agree and disagree. I would say, you know, the organic certification is a pain in the butt uh, for a reason, because you actually have to do all these things. Yep. And, um, it costs money because you're paying inspectors to make sure it happens, because we don't trust most companies. I think we trust milkadamia. You're a tree farm. You know, you're, you have owl nests to eat the rodents. Like, you're clearly doing the right thing. I think the concern is... I did a pretty successful video uh, on the a similar issue, analogous issue of direct trade versus fair trade coffee. A lot of coffee growers, growers are like, fair trade is not a great system. It costs too much money. We can do better. We're going to do direct trade. And you're like, that's awesome if you're doing it, which some coffee growers are. But a lot, just a lot of hipster coffee roasters are like, yeah, man, it's direct trade because I, I popped by on my way back from Costa Rica and it looked cool, you know? There's like butterflies everywhere. And that doesn't mean that they're paying the people right or doing all those things involved in fair trade. But um, without belaboring the point, I'll move to, you know, we have an election coming up and for the in America. And for the very first time I've ever heard, climate change is ranking not only top five issues, but number one um, overall for the Democratic candidates and also for public concern. And literally, I watched a uh, a uh, video last night, an interview of Beto O'Rourke, and he literally was talking about regenerative agriculture last night. And I had a moment where, um, you know, what is it? The uh, uh, I forget the quote, but something is the mother of invention, right? Necessity. Hey, so we finally have to wake up when we have to stop poisoning our earth. We have to start treating animals right. And uh, we have to do that not out of altruism, but to save ourselves. So I love that your farm is sucking up carbon, that you're doing everything right. So final question is obviously, you know, working with grocery stores and shipping around the world, you're shipping product all over the world. That's got to be carbon intensive. Do you offset or how do you think about that? So we, we reduce it as much as we can. So in Australia, we, um, we, we grind our macadamias to a very fine paste. Um, so it's almost liquid. That's what we bring across to the US. Wow. Then we manufacture it here. So we're, we're shipping a concentrate basically, which is a lot less. Um, oh, that's great. A lot less of an issue. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, macadamias, well, fortunately, macadamias only grow in the most amazing climate. That's why they grow in Hawaii and some parts of Australia. You know, they're, they're from Australia originally, but they only grow in the, it can be no frost, it, you know, they, they don't like that. They like to be um, cozy and warm all the time. Lots mm. of sunshine and lots of rain. That's what they like. Mm. Um, we can't grow them in Illinois. Try as we might. You know, just it, it isn't possible. But the other thing with growing them where they belong is it means that we don't have an irrigation system. Um, that's where they've always grown. You know, it, it rains or it doesn't. Um, the trees have always experienced that. They're in the soils that they know, that, that they developed in. They've got the, they've got the um, conditions that they've always known. And so there's two ways to look at local. You know, one way is to say you're shipping at a distance, which is true. It'd be great if we didn't have to. But the other way is um, we, we term local by having trees where they belong. If we were to bring macadamias to the US and start growing them here, there'd be massive amounts of input. We'd have to be warming the trees or watering them or, um, you know, or it's a... You're not shipping, but you're using just as much um, energy just to keep the yeah. trees alive. And and you know, there are there there are plenty of um, examples of crops being grown outside their normal area, and that is that's as big a problem as anything. We've, we've got to, you know, we talk about going back to original conditions. That's going to mean we we won't be able to have every fruit or every nut every day of the year because. Um, if we're going to grow them where they belong, we're going to find out it's seasonal. You know, there'll only be strawberries some time of the year, not all year round, which it isn't that big a deal, really. I don't think it's worth the planet for us to have strawberries all year round, do you? Yeah. Well, not only is it not worth the planet, it's actually more special. I mean, when you have a local, uh, you know, fruit salad, yeah. and it's actually local, and it's the first time you've had it since the prior, what, spring or fall, uh, that's got to be delightful and it, you know the flavor is so much better and the health is better they've tested local and organic tomatoes versus kind of the conventional less fresh ones and uh, obviously they don't compare um but you had me on the i love that you ship ship the paste 
That's amazing. Um, one of the worst things any of us as consumers do is buy uh, soda or, or bottled water or even laundry detergent instead of the, um, um, the concentrate uh, because shipping water is incredibly carbon intensive. Mm -hmm. So that's fantastic that you're doing that. I love that. Um, so anything else you want to get across? Do we have some giveaway? Of some yeah, do. we do. We do. All right, let's do it. I'm going to hold these up. All right. Have, we have some t-shirts. Okay. It um, says, who is moot? Moo is moot. Yeah. Nice. Sorry, it's really hard. I'm going to film Crowdcast, which is Facebook. All right. It's hopeless. But anyway, it's a cool shirt. It says, moo is moot because it's not uh, dairy. And we didn't mention, but with dairy, you're also creating the whole veal industry, which is, you know, a pretty sad thing. It's been a bad, bad couple of weeks for dairy if you've been following that whole um fair life thing um, yeah maybe tell us about that uh briefly for those who don't know about the fair life uh scandal or expose so fair life is a um is a dairy that's it's i think it's the biggest dairy in the world but they also have at the front end of it they have a little disneyland about dairy you know where there's there's um things for kids to do and they have tours um very carefully orchestrated tours, tours yeah. where they talk about how wonderful they look after their cows. Um, they actually sell children. They have video, a video of children going and seeing the wonderful world of dairy and how delightful and cute it is. And they get yeah. to pet cows and, you know, who are laying in hay and everything looks idyllic. And so there's been an expose from behind there of some of the, you know, some terrible cruelty. Um, there's four workers who have been seen you know beating and throwing cows around kicking them in the head and um suffocating them doing all sorts of ugly stuff and it's pretty clear that those guys are going to be in a severe amount of trouble as as, as it warrants but yeah. it also looks like the owner you, when you look at it those calves are in filthy pens and, the, and it wasn't those four guys who designed that you know they're being branded with red hot irons they didn't design that um they um are Draw, dragged away from their mother hours after they've been born you know the whole thing of dairy is that it's an exploitation of motherhood they they take the fact that a mother has just given birth and it needs to lactate for that reason and use that as a basis of an industry which never used to seem so bad to me i did i'd never thought of it that way but the long the deeper we get into this the more i realize this is a bad industry from top to bottom um they sell their product with a fear campaign. It's been like a hundred year long fear campaign telling us that our bones will crumble if we don't have two eight ounce glasses of milk every day, that you know humans can't exist and they can't exist healthily without without this milk, which is completely untrue. You know, there's whole whole civilizations have have blossomed and risen without dairy. But you know, that they, they would have us believe we can't survive without it. Well not only that, but there's serious health issues with yeah consuming dairy it may not be good for us period exactly exactly we're pretty sure it's not good for us you know um it, just the one thing that the com countries that consume the most dairy have the most bone fractures ha what yeah. the whole thing is a lie and then um this was this um they discovered so much cruelty going on behind the scenes of the very one who presented themselves as the kindest and most gentle right. the sad thing is that this happens every few years. You know, every few years we we are um, confronted with videos of stuff that we shouldn't be part of. You know, we and we as consumers, if we do nothing and say nothing at these times, we we become complicit. You know, we we really do have to say enough. And and there's only one thing that they listen to. That's their sales. You know, their market share, their their share prices. So there's we actually control that. You know, if we buy this product, we're supporting um, things that that we're better than. If we um, if we don't if we don't buy it, we force change, and we force change faster that way than any other way. So yeah, and this, this is you know, I, I I want to thank you for being eloquent on this. This isn't really a vegan issue. Um, this is I think anyone who enjoys meat or dairy, if you go to these factory farms and you see ones that are working as they should it's still a heartbreaking experience. Yeah. And, you know, the whole veal industry is created out of dairy and moms have, 
you know, things attached to their nipples their entire life. So they're rubbed raw and pussy and diseased and they're forcibly inseminated. It's an ugly, ugly, painful, you know, cows have been shown to have best friends. They care about their young desperately. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it only takes 30 seconds and it's a painful 30 seconds to watch one of these videos. And you're like, I don't want to be a part of this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I think um, people's values, values have shifted. Um, sensitivities have shifted. Dairy's woken up on the wrong side of history. Um, I, I think the whole meat industry too has woken up on the wrong side of history. They haven't woken up to the fact that they've woken up on the wrong side yet, but that, that is going to come. Well, as Upton Sinclair said, uh, it's difficult to make a man understand something that his uh, paycheck requires him not to understand or something like that. Yeah, let's say that was it. Close enough. <laughs> I'm, I haven't had my coffee, so I'm losing all my quotes. <laughs> so I've got, I've got one more T-shirt. Please. Um, again, this, is, this one says uh, non-dairy queen. Non-dairy queen. I love it. Non-dairy queen. So that's for the... You know, yeah. if they're a non-dairy queen, 20 of those for um, if people will write to Christina at milkadamia.com okay. and tell us um, why you'd like one of those T-shirts and we'll give away 20 of each. So there's 20 of each, moo is moot and non-dairy non queen. Yep. Uh, free T-shirt giveaway. All you have to do, uh, Instagram, Facebook is uh, email Christina at milkadamia.com. At milkadamia Dot yep. com. Yes. Perfect. Well, thank you. Uh, any last things you wanted to get across that I uh, haven't let you get to? Uh, look, no, this is a great talk. I've, I've enjoyed yeah. it. This, look, yeah. it. It can go much deeper and much wider, of course. Yeah. There's plenty more to talk about. But um, for the first time around, that's, that's great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your work. Uh, super inspiring. And uh, I guess I'll have to. And, and how does it work with coffee? I know you have a barista line, don't you? That's where we started. Our first one was a barista. Um, yeah. We started in cafes in the US. Yeah. Um, yeah, that foams beautifully. You can do great latte art um, as yeah. long as you have a steamer. It steams beautifully. Right. Cool. They, they all go in coffee. And we actually have creamers now, too. So there's a range of milkadamia creamers that are just being launched, starting to um, appear in retailers. Mm. And they are delicious. They really are something great in terms of the taste there. Yeah. Nice. Exceptional. Well, go out to your local cafe and request the barista. Milkadamia, and I know I will. And um, yeah, check out their milk products and their creamer. Well, thank, thank you, Tim. Thank you for your time. Last thing, there's a butter coming. Yeah. We'll by early next year we will have a uh, macadamia milk butter, which wow. we're we're already eating it because we're doing the early stuff, it, and it's really really great. Tastes good. Oh, so cool. Yeah, good. I had Miyoko's uh, butter this morning. You know Miyoko? Yeah, hers is good too. Fantastic. Yeah. So the vegan butters, I say this, I'm vegan, but um, for the very first time with Miyoko and a couple, maybe one or two other brands, there's actually some good stuff on the market. So I'm very excited to have another choice with you. Right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, yeah. Academia, uh, the kind of company we love. And if you feel hopeless about uh, climate change, literally regenerative agriculture reverses it. So invest in that with your daily habits. Thank you so much. Thank you, Wayland. All right.